Today we're talking about a character who's been pivotal to Marvel Comics history both on the page and off. A tragic character who has spawned a handful of others to take up his name. Today we're talking all about White Tiger. First, thanks for watching JLS Comics. Hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all of our weekly content. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into our story. Created by George Perez and Bill Mantlo, the Hector Ayala version of White Tiger first appeared in Marvel's magazine-sized Deadly Hands of Kung Fu with 1974's issue 19. At this point, Hector became Marvel's first Hispanic superhero. The idea came to Mantlo one weekend since he and George were looking for a way to wind down their Sons of the Tiger story, they decided to go in a different direction. Bill Mantlo had the idea to use his friend and partner on the book, George Perez, who's both Puerto Rican and from the Bronx, to make a character who's, yes, Puerto Rican and from the Bronx. In turn, Perez came up with White Tiger's government name, a name he says came from names of friends from his neighborhood. So the Sons of the Tiger were all linked in their friendship and power via the amulets of power that their sensei, Master Key, had bestowed upon them after rival ninjas assaulted Master Key's Tiger Dojo and killed him. According to Doctor Strange, the amulets were part of a jade tiger figurine carved in the ancient city of Kunlun. Lin had the jade tiger amulet while Diamond and Brown got the tiger claw amulets. But after some infighting, the trio decided to go their separate ways. Lin's son, his face covered in blood, sweat, and tears, gathered up the three amulets, took them outside, and threw them on the ground in a rainy alley next to a trash can on his way out. After the rain stopped falling and the cloudy skies gave way to the light, signifying a new era, a rebirth, Hector Ayala strolled through that very same alleyway and came across the amulets. When he put them around his neck, all three of them at once, Hector was imbued with a surging power, an incredible rush of energy as he transformed into the White Tiger. His mind was filled with new thoughts, and thoughts that immediately told him what his new identity was. And with this new power, Hector showed up at a train yard in South Bronx to save a kid from the Nomad Gang and from shooting a security guard with a gun. Now is the hour of light, amigos, White Tiger exclaimed as he leapt at them backlit by a full moon. And as he took on the whole gang in the shadows of the train yard, White Tiger's amulets glowed, giving him an aura that cast pale white light across his form. That boy still had the gun in his hands and he fired at White Tiger, grazing White Tiger's arm with a single shot, just as the night watchman bludgeoned the little boy on the head, killing him as he fell to the ground dead. Angry about this, White Tiger then struck the cop for what he did. Hector had wanted to save the boy and guide him away from this world of violence, but now it was too late. So he left the scene, disappointed and upset. Hector made it back to that South Bronx alley and transformed back to his human form, back to Hector Ayala. But Hector didn't remember anything about what had happened when he was White Tiger. As he headed home, he was hit with waves of nausea and he stumbled back to his family's apartment, barely holding back Montezuma's revenge. Back in his room, without his mother knowing he was out all night, Hector took off the amulets and fell asleep. Little did he know that his health and his well-being were tied to the amulets. When he reawoke, Hector had to quickly hide the amulets from his sister, Awilda. Awilda was onto him, and he was forced to lie and tell her he'd been on a date with a lady named Angela, but it turns out Awilda was with Angela, so she knew it was a lie, and Hector was still sweating about it when he went down and said good morning to his mom. Awilda was upset that their little brother Filippo was now into dope, and now she didn't also want to have to hide yet another thing from their mom. Their father, Nestor Ayala, was busy working three jobs to support his family, so he wasn't around much. And that's when a detective with the NYPD showed up looking for Hector. The police had found Hector's radio and bloody fingerprints at the train yard, which is how they were able to track him. As the officers declared that they would need to take him into custody, the amulets acted up again, taking control of Hector's body as he struck one of the officers in the face and then jumped out a window, now officially a fugitive. In the alley, the NYPD then ran into White Tiger, but this happened just as another costumed being showed up. This is when White Tiger was confronted by the Prowler, while the police were still setting up a massive cordon around the area. Prowler called White Tiger kid-killing crud. It turned out that that kid had been working with Hobie Brown, Prowler's real identity, and Prowler was angry. The White Tiger did tell him that he was innocent, and even as they fought, Prowler began to question how true the news was. And it indeed was false, as they learned what the Watchmen regained consciousness, confessed, and then said that there was no one named Hector at the crime scene. Prowler and White Tiger stopped fighting when one of the officers made it to the roof to tell them about this. And then Prowler and White Tiger went their separate ways, each jumping off of a roof in a different direction, and later White Tiger transformed back to Hector. An article then went out in the Globe in J. Jonah Jameson style asking if the masked vigilante White Tiger was a hero or a menace. Hector hid, not even coming back to his mother and sister in their apartment, and he continued to be sick for days on end and all alone. He looked at that photo in the Globe and felt that he should know El Tigre Blanco. Something was there, but he didn't know why or how. And that's when he noticed White Tiger's amulet, the same as the one he was wearing, and he said, Carajo, I'm the White Tiger. 
It finally clicked. The amulets also happened to be a key clue in the detective's case, being that one of the detectives had teamed up in Chinatown with one of the sons of the tiger, Bob Diamond. And then White Tiger went to speak with Nestor Riella, his father, but he did so with his mask still on, in disguise. He was there just to tell his father that Hector was well before disappearing once more into the night. Hector was mad and punched walls, demanding White Tiger leave him. Hector was worried about the state of his family and the effect that he was having upon them. He wanted this gone, but he wouldn't be able to do it yet because that's when a new character showed up to fight White Tiger. This new character was Jack of Hearts. Jack thought White Tiger had done the train yard killing, and not only that, but that killing was a cover-up to hide the fact that he'd also killed Jack Hart's father, and so that's why Jack was there as judge and jury to give White Tiger a trial by fire. So the two fought hard, and Jack took White Tiger down. Jack told them that he had heard talking when his father was killed, and those voices were referring to a tiger in the Bronx. And so when he learned about White Tiger, he assumed them to be one and the same. Jack and White Tiger tumbled off a rooftop head first, and Jack was knocked out just as the cops got there with Hector's sister, demanding to know where Hector was. And instead of White Tiger being arrested, the group brought Jack of Hearts to the nearest ICU for medical treatment. And while at the hospital, investigator Nathaniel Bird, also called Blackbird, questioned White Tiger as his sister Wilda ran in crying, still wanting to know where her brother was. At one point, Jack of Hearts flared up at his hospital bed, so White Tiger had to grab Jack's wrists to help him channel and contain Jack's uncontrolled discharging energy, and he saved his life. And then White Tiger was free to go, and after he talked with the investigator outside of his Miranda rights, they realized there was a bar in the South Bronx called the Tiger Bar, which could potentially be their next lead. A trio burst in demanding Jack Hart, and for a leverage, they managed to take a Wilda Ayala hostage. Tiger fought them off long enough for Jack to channel enough power to shoot one of them out a window, and in those moments, Wilda came to realize that White Tiger was her brother Hector, and so she lashed out, deeply upset with the trouble he'd brought upon the family the past couple days. Wilda collapsed to the ground. To protect her mind, she tried to convince herself that this wasn't Hector, that Hector was dead, and this tiger was a stranger. But he talked with her, saying he didn't choose this, but that he was nothing before, and he'd been given a power, and he couldn't ignore it. It wasn't enough for her, though. She got up and left the room without nary a word. But instead of chasing after his sister, Tiger and the investigator set their sights on that tiger bar. And they burst into the bar and spoke with the bartender named Whitewash, demanding to know where El Tiger was. Whitewash let loose with a Tommy gun before White Tiger swooped in and kicked it out of his hands. And White Tiger pulled off his mask and talked with the detectives, unsure if he was in over his head and questioning everything that had transpired. And he walked out of the bar and ended up chatting with a 13-year-old girl named Cheeky Margarito Molino, who told him that White Tiger was an inspiration. And then, just like the kid the other night, she was mysteriously killed right in front of White Tiger, just before Bird and D'Angelo showed up. And then an angry mob also showed up, armed with broken bottles and bats and sticks, and charged White Tiger and the detectives, calling Tiger a kid killer. One of them pulled a weapon and shot Tiger in his ribcage, but instead of going down, White Tiger got angry and fought back, nearly killing some of them as D'Angelo and Bird begged him to stop. And he kept fighting even as 41st Precinct showed up. The crowd was driven back and Bird punched Tiger in the gut, dropping him to the ground to stop him. Then we told Hector he would thank him in the morning for doing that. And then Hector's brother Filippo showed up at their house, strapped with half a million dollars worth of opium linked to a belt bomb that would blow up if he didn't deliver the product. He was desperate. He said he needed help. Meanwhile, Jack of Hearts heard about the fight and flew by to help his friend White Tiger. Tiger had run away, wounded and collapsed on a dirty windswept rooftop where the ghosts of Jack's dad and the boy and the girl appeared before him. When he heard Wilda cry out in the night, he jumped down to the street to help her, and then White Tiger fought off the crooks to save his sister and protect his brother. This was happening as Jack of Hearts discovered information about a junta nationalized freighter coming into port from Chile, which was called El Tigre. Despite that, there was still an uneasy relationship between him, his family, his neighborhood, and the police. Was he helping? Was he being used? Was he worthy? Tiger teamed up with his brother and headed down to the docks. And Filippo was there to make his delivery to a man named Maris at the El Tiger freighter. But Maris was dead. It turns out Maris was the guy who'd killed Jack of Hearts' father. Blackbird then went to Nightwing Investigations, which was Misty Knight and Colleen Wing's investigation office, and met with Shang-Chi and Iron Fist, asking them for help with his friend White Tiger. And so they all teamed up to fight back against the smugglers. And then, in another twist, Filippo turned on his brother Hector and revealed he'd been a guiding hand behind the events the past couple nights, and that he was working with Fu Manchu. Fu turned on Filippo, and they could do nothing, and so Hector granted his brother's last request, to let the belt bomb explode and take him and the shipment out with him. One final good act. In the ruins and the wreckage of the docks, White Tiger cried over his brother's death, but still knowing he'd saved many people with the destroyed drugs. At the end of the story, the sons of Tiger reunited to deal with the Harmony Kill Dragon, then invited White Tiger to stay with them to join their group and to investigate why the amulets drew them together once more.
And it was then that White Tiger made the jump from black and white magazine to traditional colored comic book form. And he did that with 1977's Peter Parker, The Spectacular Spider-Man, issue 9. Hector had now decided, instead of joining the Sons of Tiger, to take night courses at Peter Parker's school, ESU. But ESU president Dwyer had shut down night classes, so a riot broke out. And in the midst of those rioters, Hector Ayala met Peter Parker. The school had needed funds to keep those classes open, yet refused to sell their highly valuable Erskine manuscript papers to raise funds. That evening, Peter Parker went to the library to think, just before a group of thieves from Snake Eyes Black Hand Group also went to the library to steal the Erskine papers, which were being held in that building. White Tiger took them down, and just as he won, Parker saw him and thought Tiger was a thief too. They had a brief kerfuffle before Tiger knocked a bookcase on top of Parker and ran out, manuscript in hand. Tiger got away, and in the confusion, he was again thought to be a violent thief. Spider-Man broke into the globe to read the file on White Tiger, and he saw photos of him teamed up with heroes in the past, along with a detective from Harlem, which was Blackbird. So Parker went to talk to Blackbird, and Bird told Parker all about Tiger. Tiger then went to Professor Vasquez, who now had the Erskine manuscript in his office. How did that happen? White Tiger was choking the professor when Spider-Man showed up. Again, believed to be a villain, Spidey and White Tiger battled once more. Their fight took them over rooftops, falling on a truck, traveling across the Triborough Bridge straight toward the South Bronx. And as they tumbled off, somewhere on Lincoln Ave, people were cheering Tiger and Spidey began to think he'd pulled a big boner. Their words, not mine. He'd made a mistake. It turned out that Professor Vasquez was pretending to be White Tiger, and it was he who had stolen the manuscript and knocked that bookcase onto Spider-Man. Ian had set White Tiger up for the theft. At that point, White Tiger and Spider-Man teamed up, turned on the true criminals, and shook hands at the end, now amigos. Hector showed up in Human Fly's book next, still trying to figure out his place in his direction. Should he try to finish school, or should he lean further into being a symbol of his people? At an inner city festival, Hector discovered a body in a museum exhibit that was celebrating Puerto Rican culture and history, and Human Fly came in to investigate as Hector changed to the White Tiger attire. And they paired up when Arthur Reynolds' Copperhead was revealed to be the culprit. From there, Hector guest appeared in a series of spectacular Spider-Man issues, still taking classes at ESU, and now also dating a lady named Holly Gillis. He was there when Ox, Montana, and Fancy Dan of the Enforcers attacked a mall shop, and when Spidey showed up to fight them, Holly ended up running away. She was tired of being around all this danger. After the fight, Hector talked with Spidey, but Spider-Man didn't recognize Hector, which Hector was relieved about. Lightmaster was watching the news of the battle, and when Hector came out, he thought he was Spider-Man. So Lightmaster jumped Hector on the ESU campus, breaking off Ayala's amulets right in front of Peter Parker and flew away with his body. Parker couldn't do anything yet and risked being exposed, but he got a tracker planted before Lightmaster flew off. Parker found the amulets and realized Hector and White Tiger were one and the same. Spidey gave Hector the amulets and he transformed back to the White Tiger and they took down Lightmaster, but not before White Tiger's identity was exposed to the entire city on television. Later, Hector went to talk with Holly, but she wasn't having it. She didn't want to come home to a dead boyfriend, so she left again. Hector was distraught and depressed for a few issues, and later, after a ton of new additions were made to the Defenders, Hercules chose Black Goliath, Iron Fist, Hellcat, Havoc, Captain Ultra, and White Tiger to be his Defenders team, but that didn't last long. Later, White Tiger battled the Savage Skulls Gang in South Bronx, which was a good way to channel his grief over losing Holly. Hector was still having a hard time deciding if education or self-preservation was more important at the moment, something he mulled over at his apartment one day. A will that called him stupid for playing superhero again, about maybe breaking Mama's heart and putting his scholarship in jeopardy. She said, when are you going to grow up? Later, someone broke in and trashed Parker's apartment, so Hector said that Peter could crash with him. And that night, Parker went to meet Hector at the campus library and found Hector unconscious on the floor with the words, Ashes to Ashes, Parker, written across Hector with dust. It turns out to be the wayward son, Carry On. Holly showed up and dragged Hector to safety while Parker, as Peter, not Spidey, fought with Carrion. When Hector came to, he quickly transformed and leapt into action to help his friend Parker. Hector and Holly brought Peter to the campus infirmary afterwards for medical care. And then this undergrad named Randy Vale, who'd become the pawn of Miles Warren's Carrion, took on the name and costume of Darter and fought with Spider-Man and White Tiger. Parker was out in the open as bait while White Tiger watched from the rooftops. And White Tiger ended up fighting with Darter while Spider-Man dueled with Carrion. Tiger talked with Detective D'Angelo to tell him that Parker was still battling with Carrion and some amorphous pre-cloned spider amoeba, which ended up turning on Carrion while Spider-Man barely escaped. Then, tragedy struck. Hector and Holly had gotten work driving around with a van full of books teaching kids how to read. Hector was finally finding some happiness. But one night he came home and found his apartment shot up and his mom and dad both murdered. And his sister, barely alive, died in his arms. Hector paired up with Blackbird to find the culprits, first approaching a guy named Gunther. And Blackbird had to pull White Tiger back from the brink of killing Gunther. Don't be like them, Blackbird told Hector. 
Gunther told them that some out-of-town muscle was responsible, and that one of them was holed up in a candy store, while another was holed up in a storefront on Tremont. As White Tiger headed that way, he thought to himself about how none of it would have happened if Lightmaster hadn't revealed his identity to the world, that those deaths were senseless, and despite his power, he had no way to stop it. Tiger stormed one of the locations. Gunther had given up and nearly killed the man before realizing it was just a derelict and innocent. Tiger was struggling to control his rage to not become the very thing he was fighting against. At the second spot, he was ambushed by Gideon Mace and his hoodlums. Gideon Mace's crew shot up White Tiger, beat him unconscious, and dubbed his body in front of Peter Parker in front of the Daily Bugle building. Hector's heartbeat was weakened and he'd lost a lot of blood and so Hector was taken away in an ambulance, still quite unsure if he would make it. Peter went with Hector in the ambulance to the hospital. Luckily, Blackbird showed up at the hospital and was able to tell the medical staff to keep Hector's ambulance around his neck, that he'd get even weaker without them and that if they were off, he definitely wouldn't make it through the night. In the operating room, physicians removed slugs from Hector's body. As they continued to work on him, his amulet started to glow while Peter assaulted the stronghold of Gideon Mace and his army. And then when Hector was well enough, he decided to take off the amulets for good. Though they made him the White Tiger, it had cost him his home and his family and put his friends and girlfriend in grave danger. The costs for him outweighed the positives. Hector collapsed to the floor and said, White Tiger must die! I must purge him from my body. And then three weeks later, Holly and Hector left New York on a bus sent off by Blackbird and Spider-Man. Holly and Hector wanted to live somewhere where people didn't know that Hector had once been White Tiger to start anew. Hector handed the amulets to Blackbird and asked that they be returned to the Sons of the Tiger. And then, many years later, White Tiger was back in the 38th issue of Daredevil's 1998 run. Some crooks had stolen a TV from a pawn shop in the Bronx and killed police officer Perkins with it. And just as White Tiger showed up to stop them, other police officers showed up, only to find White Tiger with a bloody television in his hands and a dead cop at his feet. Shades of his original stories. The Daily Bugle printed on the front page, Superhero Cop Killer. In the next night in Hell's Kitchen, Luke Cage, Daredevil, and Danny Rand talked about how Hector Ayala had retired, but was apparently now back. Danny and Luke were there to ask to be Hector's defense attorney. Daredevil didn't want to, but they pleaded with him, promising that Hector was a good man, and so Matt Murdock agreed to go to Rikers to talk with Hector to see if his opinion would change. And it did. Hector told Matt he was innocent, and really didn't know why he'd decided to come out of retirement after all this time. He just did. Murdock also met with Holly, now Holly Ayala, now Hector's wife, but she said she intended to file for divorce as soon as possible. He broke in his promise to her, but Murdock told her to stick with him until the end of the trial, that her not being in court to support Hector would be all a jury would need to suspect guilt. Everything was on trial and as evidence, even his bloodstained white tiger suit. Murdock called Hector to the stand, and Hector told the story of what happened, that he tried to get the cops to go after the thugs who had actually shot Officer Perkins, but they wouldn't listen to him. And as a tear rolled from Hector's eye, he said no one would listen to him. Not until today. Potential foreshadowing. On cross-reference, the DA put Hector's marriage on trial and Holly ran out crying. The DA asked if White Tiger was there to protect the neighborhood from criminals or from guys with masks. Meaning, was he contributing to the problem or helping? The probing got to Hector and he had an outburst in court, ranting about how he'd sacrificed everything to protect people. He could have used his power to take what he wanted, but he didn't, is what he yelled aloud in the courtroom. But Murdoch came back with good retorts in his closing, highlighting how the prosecutor was yelling and goading Hector, picking apart his life at home, not for the scales of justice, but merely to win a case. While the jury deliberated, Murdoch and Foggy Nelson talked. The trial wasn't looking good, and while they were all talking, Hector was by himself, alone, sobbing in a cell. Sadly, despite Murdoch's best, despite the lack of evidence, despite his true innocence, the jury found Hector Ayala guilty of murder. Hector was inconsolable as the bailiff approached him to put on the handcuffs and take him back into custody. And Hector was confused. How did he lose if he was innocent? Why was this happening to him? Why would nobody listen? Hector had an outburst and ended up fighting with the bailiffs and the sheriffs. One of the officer's guns dropped at Hector's feet, and Hector picked it up, tears rolling down his face. He then ran out of the courtroom. He wanted his life back. He wanted his wife and to show them he wasn't guilty. So Hector ran out of the courtroom, but outside on the steps of the courthouse, he was surrounded by police, press, and a crowd of onlookers. They told him to drop the weapon, but Hector decided his life was already over. What did he have to look forward to? Prison? His family was dead. His home was gone. His wife left. Nobody would listen. Instead of complying, he closed his eyes and deliberately raised the weapon, knowing fully what would come next. And as a tear rolled down his cheek, they opened fire. Hector was dead. Tragedy right on the stairs of the halls of justice. The scales bloodied. After he died, Daredevil found the boy who'd committed the crime and made him go to the police to admit to it. And though it was too late, Hector's name was cleared. From there, the amulets passed to Angela Del Toro, along with Casper Cole and Ava Ayala. But those are for a future video, so for now, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.